Hey everybody, welcome back. So I'm going to do today something I haven't done before, but it's something I've wanted to do and I'll continue to do as I meet people that have success stories that are interested in having me tell them. And I've had a a person reach out um, really since the beginning of, of my starting these videos, and he's always been a source of inspiration in his comments and even though he's um, way out of the woods and doing much, much better in his life, he kind of sticks around and, and is a, um, a, an important light in the darkness for all of us. So I asked him if we could have a phone conversation where I could kind of interview him and hear his story and tell it. And he was more than happy for me to do that. So Tim, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. So this is the story of Tim. <clears throat> and it's uh, a fascinating story, as all of ours are. I mean, fascinating in the sense of like horrific, you know, and um, not anything we would <clears throat> have ever scripted for ourselves, but shocking, um, as most of ours are. So Tim is 64 years old now, but his story began really at the end of 2015, so about seven years ago. And he really was kind of, he's a renaissance guy, still is. Um, successful musician, very kind of famous songwriter for television shows and commercials, very successful businessman um, with a very important career that I won't go into details because it's a little bit too specific, Um, a pilot, an athlete. He ran marathons. He could no no problem run 10 miles a day. Just a really, you know, all-round kind of successful, high-energy, successful guy on lots of levels of his life. And around the end of 2015, he began to experience some insomnia. And, um, you know, as we all know, that can be horrific. And he would go days at a time without getting any sleep. And at this point, he did have that very important job I was talking about that actually was very um, imperative that he was probably rested and well to do the job because it was, you know, of, of, of national security level. Um, and, uh, that level of importance. And so the insomnia really mattered. And of course, along with that, he started to begin to have panic attacks. <clears throat> now, if you listen to my last couple of videos where I talk about allostatic load, that really to me explains why many of us hit periods of times in our life where we're doing fine and then suddenly we're not. Uh, something's tipped the bucket. And maybe just a couple of weeks, we would feel better if we could just get our sleep under control, we could navigate our stressors a little bit better. But after several weeks of not being able to sleep and these panic attacks, being very debilitating, his girlfriend, you know, said that we really need to go to the ER. <clears throat> and he kind of, you know, willing, unwillingly, uh, hesitantly agreed and goes off to the ER where they say, oh, we see this all the time. Here's some Ativan, take it. And Tim takes it while he's there in the ER and immediately sleeps. Six hours, he said he thought he slept and woke up and was like, oh my God, I feel normal. Which is, you know, the story of most of us when we start these meds, or a lot of us anyway. And they sent him home with what they called three days worth of pills, three days worth of Ativan, which we could, but they gave him 15 pills for those three days. Well, Tim wasn't going to take that many. He just was taking one at a time. But they also said that for he needed to actually um, go and, and, and register at an outpatient treatment center that they recommended for anxiety. So he's compliant and he does this and he's, you know, not sure what he's but if he needs it, but he's going to do it anyway. And he gets there and he meets with the doctor and they give him a prescription for 30 more Ativan. Um, and he begins to attend this outpatient treatment center for five hours a day for anxiety. And he's like, you know, Jennifer, they had me, you know, coloring in coloring books and then talking about what I colored. And he was like, you know, I was running, <laughs> you know, uh, my life, you know, just weeks before was profoundly different. And here I was coloring coloring books and I just didn't want to do this. And I stopped. And so he stopped going to the outpatient treatment for his anxiety. And he kept taking the Ativan, but he would only take like one a day, not as many as they had prescribed. And then after a week or two, that stopped working. He had to increase it again. And then that would stop working. He'd have to increase it again. So he started doing some research and realized, oh gosh, you know, I've been put on lorazepam, Ativan, and this is known to be highly addictive. And he did his research and he realized he needed to start tapering. Um, But he didn't really know exactly how to taper. So in about um, a a several week period, he went from 1.5 milligrams down to a third of a milligram. So he tapered very, very fast in a short period of time. Now keep in mind at this point, he'd only been on this stuff for, you know, at best a month or so. So it's not like, and he'd never been on it before, um, but here he was on it tapered 1.5 down to basically about 0.33 milligrams. So a very fast taper 
in our world of tapering as we know it. But he didn't know better. And of course, he'd only been on it such a short time and felt so badly on it, it made sense to come off of it. And here begins just the beginning of the end for Tim at this point. And um, he talks about getting to a place where he's a, he's down to about the 0.33 mark of the milligram of, of the uh, Ativan. And he's out changing tires. And he said, you know, I'm a kind of a big guy. I'm an athlete. Remember, he ran marathons and you know could run 10 miles at a time easy, no joke. And he's out changing tires on his girlfriend's car and he realizes he can barely lift the tires. And he's like, my strength is just gone. And later that day, he walks outside and all of a sudden everything was very bright, almost as if like when you've come out of the eye doctor from having your eyes dilated. And he's thinking, what the hell's going on? He's starting to kind of panic about this because it's really strange stuff. He finds Benzo Buddies and realizes, you know, he's, he's got to finish tapering. He's got to taper. He's got to do something. He's starting to run out of pills and he knows that he needs to get a few more pills at least to continue this taper and probably to slow it down. Remember, at this point, he's on 0.33, a third of a milligram of Ativan, okay, uh, which is the equivalent of uh, about, what would that be, uh, about three milligrams or so of Valium, not high doses of things, and he's also not been on them a long time. So he finds, he starts looking around for a psychiatrist, somebody that can help him. He finds a psychiatrist nearby that says that he has experience with people getting off benzos, and Tim goes in to meet with him, and um, the doctor says, well, you know, you're not that young of a guy. So at this point, Tim would have probably been, you know, I don't know what, 59. But the doctor says, you know, you're not that young of a guy. And a lot of older people need to go on these drugs and stay on these drugs. And Tim's like, well, I don't want to do that. I feel terrible on it. I was fine before it. And uh, the guy steps out and consults with another doctor and he can hear them kind of laughing at him and saying that he is manic depressive, which is another word for bipolar. And Tim's like, I'm not bipolar. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm struggling with these pills. And he said that they were kind of laughing at him and kind of mocking him. And they did give him five more pills, but said, you need to come back. As soon as you're done with these five pills, you know, take, take, take one and then take a half and then take a half. And you're going to come off the rest of this. And then you're going to come back in. And because if you don't, you know, we're basically considering you kind of drug seeking. So he was mortified, as you can imagine. He finds another place. And this place tells him, go to immediately to the hospital. You need to be on these medications. So he doesn't follow through with that one. He finds another place trying to find anybody that will help him. This place says you're probably a hypochondriac. This is all in your head. Doesn't obviously follow through with that person. He finally finds a psychiatrist who's more benzo-wise, runs a benzo group actually. And Tim meets with him and he says, I'm going to switch you over to Valium, which is you know slower acting. <clears throat> um and a little easier to taper off of. And they, he, ta- he moves him over to a little bit more than what he had been on in terms of the equivalent of the Ativan. <clears throat> but switches him over to about th- a little over three milligrams, it sounds like, of Valium, uh, to, to liquid Valium. And right away in that switch, he has a day of feeling completely normal. He remembers that day. I, he says that he actually went to a concert and felt great. But that the minute he started to cut down, the minute he started to taper... Um, no matter how slow it was, things just took off and went crazy. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to give you a list of his symptoms here in a second. So remember now, he's on three milligrams of Valium liquid, and it takes him two and a half years to taper off of that three milligrams. He's highly symptomatic the entire way down. If he goes faster, he can't function at all. I'm sure suicidality at that point probably really enters the equation, although that wasn't something Tim said. But to go from the level of functioning he was already at to think that it could get worse was just his biggest fear. And I'm sure what he feared was you know, death um, based on what you'll hear in a second. So at the minute he begins a very, very slow taper off. The, he finds Benzo Buddies. He's doing a very slow taper off of this liquid Valium um, and he's falling apart. He finds another a clinician nearby that wants to do biofeedback who's saying there's no way the benzos are doing this. And, you know, Tim says, well, look, there's benzo buddies, there's all these groups. And these, and basically this doctor says, you're going to believe a bunch of buddies over me. These people are all making it up. So, you know, Tim decides I'm going to stick with at least the person who's giving me the Valium and uh, do what I have to do to, to, to get off this stuff slowly. At least, at least this person's going to work with me. 
He did meet with one other doctor, a friend of his um, or a colleague of his that he knew of, and uh, that person said it's not benzos, it's your thyroid. Well, he got his thyroid tested and thyroid was fine. In the meantime, he is falling apart. So here's a list of the symptoms that began for Tim as he went, entered into his taper off of this uh, three milligrams of Valium that again took him two and a half years to come off of. Generalized anxiety, terror, depression, monophobia, which is the fear of being alone, agoraphobia, which is the fear of being of leaving your home in safe space, night sweats, head pressure, a feeling like he had to constantly move, especially at night, so kind of a form of akathisia, muscle spasms and twitching, severe insomnia, going two to three days at a time with no sleep, face burning. He would constantly cry um, and say things like, I don't want to die. I don't want to kill myself. I don't want to kill myself. And he wasn't suicidal. He says, I don't even really know why I was saying that. I was just out of my mind. When it would come time for a meal and he got the least bit hungry, he would start to cry and get dysregulated and overwhelmed whenever he was hungry. He had looping thoughts. He had depersonalization and derealization, loss of strength, uh, tinnitus, Felt that the lights were always too bright. Sounds near, around him like a pencil dropping could sound like a bomb going off. Uh, he had severe reactions to hot and cold temperatures. Um, it would feel like a lightning bolt was going through him. When he would doze, it would wake him up to this like lightning bolt through his body and light and as well as like symbols going off in his ears um, that would kind of clash and wake him up each time he would doze. He could only shower maybe once a month because the water just felt excruciating and he was terrified. And this is a guy who was running 10 miles a day who could no longer walk to the end of the driveway because he was too weak or too terrified to do so. So I was just kind of dumbfounded in listening to this story because, again, you know, short-term use, one-time use, um, very low dose, um, and kind of like Christy Huff, you know, who took Xanax for a couple of weeks and then took three and a half years to get off the Valium and five years to really feel like she was starting to feel better. Here's Tim, same situation, very short-term use. And I'm not saying any of this to scare you. I'm actually saying this to give you the end of the story, which is this is somebody who, for whatever reason, and we'll never know all the right reasons, or at least, at least I shouldn't say we'll never know. I hope we one day know why. Um, it's, you know, but regardless, we don't know why now some people can take these drugs and come off of them fine. Why some people have problems the second time they come off, whatever. We don't know the reasons for that, but for Tim, it was immediate and he was just unable to do anything. He had to leave his career. He wasn't able to make music. He wasn't able to play his drums. He wasn't able to write music. He wasn't able to exercise. He wasn't able to leave his home. His support system really didn't understand what was going on and didn't believe him. They kept thinking he needed to try harder and try harder and do more. And he was just, you know, getting, he was involved in that secondary trauma of not being believed and just falling apart. And again, the taper took about two and a half years for him to finally get off that three milligrams of Valium. And he describes, you know, that the five or six months after he gets off, he starts to do things. Now, he's not able to do things while he's in his taper um, at all. I mean, he's really completely debilitated at this point, mentally and physically. And again, not working, kind of has lost everything. His girlfriend stood beside him, but really didn't understand and was, you know, really upset with him that he wasn't trying harder. And, um, and so he would describe, like, in the months following getting off of it, you know, for example, he began to try to push himself to cut the grass. He used to be able to cut the, he would run with the lawnmower before and cut the, his front and back lawn in 20 minutes. He said, after I started my tape, after I finished my taper, I would go back to trying to cut the lawn. And what would normally take me 20 minutes to do both lawns, it would take me two days to cut the front lawn. And I would have to stop and come in and I would be shaking and twitching and my mind would be racing and I'd feel out of control and he would just be completely overwhelmed and dysregulated. Um, and then he'd try to go back out. And he kept, he said, you know, I kept trying to do stuff. And what he found was that, like, if he would go out, let's say, to be in a social situation, he would feel like crying. He would, he would want to drop to his knees. He would want to hide out. 
He would feel like he was losing his mind. He said there were times that people actually had to help him walk because he was so disoriented, dysregulated, and weak. And uh, But he found that if he stayed, that eventually he would kind of get to the other side of it. And not that he felt well, but that he wasn't at that critical level. So he, so after the taper, he would sometimes go and be with friends and he would think, I got to get out of here, I got to get out of here. And he would tell them that. And they would say, no, you're safe, you're with us, you're with friends, it's okay. And he would just kind of let that, you know, if you can imagine that rising, 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 rising of the panic and all the dysregulation that we feel. And he said he would feel it like as if he was just about to lose it and, and flee. And then it would, if he stayed long enough, it would normally dissipate. This is something I talk about in my videos that I experience as well, is that not every time, but, but if I can try to not run as it's peaking, as it's moving up into some sort of like, I'm going to go crazy, I'm going to lose my mind, I'm going to faint, pass out, throw up, scream something, whatever it is, it, my, it, I, I often see the other side of it. And again, I don't feel well, but I don't feel that bad. But he describes his healing process as taking many, many months after uh, coming off the medication. And I've asked him now, here we are in 2022. And um, this all would have wrapped up for Tim, if I'm doing my math right, probably around 2018. And he said, Jennifer, I'm beyond healthy. In fact, I'm healthier than I was before I actually took the meds, and I was healthy then. Uh, he changed his diet, um, and you know, again, it probably didn't help much, maybe in the immediate sense. But you know, again, all of these things that we can do along the way that are good for us, even if they don't help us in the immediate sense of things, they can have long-term gains. And so, there's certain things that he. He actually said to me, I can't believe I would have ever said this, John, because not in a million years when I was in that two and a half to three year period did I think I would ever heal. I never thought I'd be the same again. I never thought I'd be able to work again. I never thought I'd be happy again. I never thought I'd feel sane again. I never thought I'd trust my mind and my body again for three years. And, and I said, Tim, did you get any breaks? Did you get a couple hours here or there, a day here and there? Did you get window or glimpses? And he said, not one. The only time he got a window was that day he, that doctor transitioned him over from Ativan to Liquid Valium, and he got that night where he went to a concert. It was the only time in that entire process that he got some normalcy. But once he started the taper, he never hit normalcy. And like I said, he was very, very debilitated, could not even go into his driveway. But he said to me, I'm actually glad it happened. And he's like, I don't even really know how to explain that, except for I just don't see the world the same way. Um, and you know, I think I can understand this because I've heard this from many people now that have come through the other side of it, is you just don't see the world the same way. I mean, I, and I can imagine that. I, I can already get glimpses of that where, like I've said, sights and sounds and smells and what's important and all of that. You know, And Tim had to go through a pretty dark period after he did heal where he was really angry. Um, at all these doctors. He was really angry at everybody in his support system, the people that didn't believe him and, and made him feel crazy and made him feel like he, it was his fault and it was his will and if he would just try harder. But he's had to let go of that. And, um, and so in talking to him, I mean, his voice was strong. And um, he told me that something interesting. He's like, the one thing that, that changed that has stayed is he said, you know, when I hear a song now, it could be a sad song or just a great song that moves me, he will start to cry. And he said, I never understood people that you know would hear a song and cry. And he said, I'm not complaining about this. It's, it's moving. It's, 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 I like this quality in me, you know, that he feels things so deeply. Um, but it was so good to talk to him. And I wanted to tell his story because so often many of us are listening to my audios or other people's videos or whatever and we're in we're in that two and a half to three year period that Tim lived in where he mentally and physically and cognitively was just beat up beyond repair and felt like he had lost anything and everything in his life and all of these skill sets that he had once had, all of these talents that he had once had, he thought were gone forever. And to be saying that he's living his best life now, healthier than he's ever felt before, 
it's just really given me a lot of hope. And it was a story that I wanted to share with you guys. And I've thanked him for listening to my videos, for making comments on there. And I've asked him to please stick around and that we need more people like Tim to say, I went through hell and it didn't last a month. It didn't last a week. It didn't last a couple days. And I was told by six different doctors that I was a hypochondriac, that I had bipolar, that I, it was all in my head, that I'm making it up, that I had other physical issues. And none of it was true. It was all the drug. And even though it took years to heal, he is healed. And in his mind, he's healed and then some. So I just wanted to share this with you guys because we need to hear these good news. the good news. We need to re be reminded that there is an end to our this torture. And whether it's a three-year process for you like it was for Tim after taking something for a month, whether it's a five-year process for you, whether it's a seven-year process for you, whether it's a three-month process for you, whatever it is, when you're in hell, it's, it's too long, right? Like any degree of hell for any amount of time is too long. And, um, but, you know, I, 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 this story and, for example, the story of Chris Page also, who I often reference, who was in hell for you know, five years, you know, and living his best life too. These are the people I draw from and many, many more stories. Geraldine Burns, all of these people that come back and say, Life is beautiful on the other side, and you have a different appreciation. And as much as you think it's never going to end, it will. And so thank you, Tim, for taking the time to speak to me today. I hope I did your story justice. And I really appreciate you being willing to let me share it with listeners so that they can feel um, what I felt today, which was a lot of hope in listening to a man's voice who was jubilant and, and happy and in, in touch with himself and all of his skill sets and all of his talents and all of his dreams are back again. So thanks guys.